Today's a special day. It's part of our small builder series. I'm here with Shell Money from Money Bikes, and today we're taking a first look at the Money La Roca. Okay, this bike has some really, really unique, interesting things going on about it. And I'm gonna let Shell walk you through it because who better than the guy who designed it and built the original La Roca in his own shop? It's definitely a party hardtail, <laughs> but uh, it's a bike packing hardtail. So we have a lot of mounts. Uh, we didn't go short on mounts. So I have like a three pack here, three pack under, um, a bottle on the seat tube. Uh, we have um, fender and rack here. Um, so there's uh, quite a bit of versatility in, in the frame. Definitely ready to, you know, put a rigid fork on, full bike packing rig, suspension fork, um, kind of more of, of like an Arizona Trail single track kind of bike packing thing. But um, I guess at its very core, it's a fun hardtail. That's, that's kind of what we shoot for. It's not meant to do any other thing dedicated. It doesn't have to be ridden as a bike packing bike. It doesn't have to do anything. Your bike packing bike doesn't have to be boring and slow. It's it's definitely built for fun. And so, you know, short rear center, uh, that's not, I didn't invent that. That's like, that's something that makes a bike, you know, lively and fun to handle, you know, easy to pull up, wheelie manual, that sort of thing. I really look at grip to rear axle. So a lot of our bars have sweep you know, a fair amount of sweep, this one a little bit less, um, but you're talking about um, a medium reach, a regular seat tube angle, so that brings your effective top tube a little bit to the rear of the bike, and that's bringing your handlebar a little bit more centered. This is a great single speeding bike for sure, um, because when you're out of the saddle, you don't care what your seat tube angle is. So Shell mentioned single speeding. He's a big single speed nerd, even more than I am. And he's a coaster brake nerd too. And he, the way he describes it is money bikes is the end of the coaster brake rabbit hole. When you've gone down that, that rabbit hole of researching what makes coaster brakes awesome, uh, they've got some really cool solutions for that. We're not going to go too deep into it, but this is coaster brake. Uh, coaster brake capable, capable, coaster brake capable. Yeah. Yeah. At first glance, it looks from far away, like a traditional hardtail with fun geometry. But when you get in close, you notice this thing has sliding dropouts and they're unlike anything else you've seen. Talk us through your dropouts. Uh, we call them the money changers because we're big into puns. But uh, on my prototypes, it was real, a lot less burly. People ask me, can it, you know, I'm 250 pounds. Can it handle it? And I, I never boast about uh, being able to hold up to larger riders, but it, it has uh, proved itself. So... Um, we have a telescoping system here. I have flex in the seat stays and then a telescoping portion right here with two binders. There's a knurled piece of stainless so you never get like a corrosion lockup in the telescope. And the knurled piece is also a little bit thicker so you can get quite a bit of clamping force on that sliding portion. So you have it sliding in and out here and the, chain st and the seat stays flex for you. And that gives you your travel to either tension a single speed hub, tension a roll off. These bikes are roll off ready. We have cabling so you could run double shifter roll off readiness if, if you're into that. Um, so what it is that this rear axle is pulling out and um, you can run a uh, slam setup. Uh, this bike has a derailleur, a tensioner, so you can run it slammed if you want it. You can pull it out for a longer chain stay, longer-ish. Mm -hmm. um, but the yeah, the concept is tunability or single speed tension and as clean as possible. So there's also a little down sweep in the chain stay here and it allows that telescope to kind of work at a more natural inclination. And then also it allows us to get a low mount caliper because it's better. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that low mount caliper can be run as a coaster brake mount too. Yeah, so you can run your torque arm That's to the cool. the little slider option on this side. But I always tell people there's five bolts here. There's two on each side and then one more on the brake mount to allow the bike to slide in and out. This is your design? Yeah. That is yeah. so cool. I think it's yeah. so unique and so clean. And it took me like five minutes looking at this to realize, wait a minute, is this a sliding dropout? It is, but it's unlike any other sliding dropout you've seen before. Yeah, we designed it to be as clean as possible. So uh, I guess one of my, 
one of my tastes in uh, in bike frames, I want it to be a bike frame. I don't want it to be a bike frame with a mechanism on the back. And so that's kind of where this design comes from. It's It doesn't have like a, a slider toggle rocker, everything. It's, um, it's, it's as kind of clean as you can make it, so. It's super clean, well done. Thanks. Shell's a man after my own heart. You like 29 plus as well on a lot of your bikes. What kind of tire clearance can we expect on this thing? Um, so one of the design constraints is I wanted it to look like a bike frame. And so uh, it doesn't have elevated stays. Uh -huh. and so to fit a full 3.0 plus, you probably need to be in elevated stay territory. Um, but we have really tried to maximize clearance. So um, I advertise 2.8. Uh, the, these will squish a, a 3.0 most of the time with a modest rim. Um, so as, as much as you can get on a regular double diamond frame, right. I think we've, we've done that here. So um, 3.0, maybe 2.8. Definitely, and cool. uh, that's twenty nine by two eight. Twenty nine two eight, and Sweet. and uh, twenty seven five by three zero. Can you fit that on here? It doesn't get much better on a twenty seven five. Mm -hmm. So it's still that kind of like tight, two tight spot. two eight three zero possible, but cool. not recommended. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So it de definitely a plus bike. I have ridden, you know, I've ridden Baja, ridden um, some bikes, some routes that really like a plus tire and like a two eight um, is you know a great setup on this bike. <laughs> well, today we got it built up with 27 fives and a 160 fork. You can build it a couple different ways. It's, How else do you, do you build them up? Um, you know, it's it's kind of sweet spotted at 140, but... Um, As a 29er? Yep, it has uh -huh. a, a higher BB. So the higher BB and the slack head angle and the regular seat tube angle start playing with a lot of different forks pretty well. So if you go down to a 120, you're going to get like a 74 degree seat angle, mm -hmm. which is still plenty... You know, that's, that's 60, not even steep. Yeah, 66 and a half. That's not crazy either. Nope. And then your BB goes from 40 drop to 50 drop. So Perfect. it started high and then it goes a, a tiny bit lower. So mm -hmm. um, it's happy with a 120. It's happy with a 120 corrected rigid fork, which is what we oh, offer. Cool. And then with the squishy fork, I figure let's let's make the, the character change just so. So the, when you put that squishy fork on, you're really getting that kind of nice slacker all mountainy feel and then if you go 120 it's changing that feel so it really like my geo chart has four forks so it can it can really you know span quite a range and that's that's definitely on purpose we like to make them as flexible as possible for sure well thank so. you for doing that i know all of our viewers love to nerd out on geo charts and, <laughs> and and the clearer we can make that with different forks the better so you've been building bikes for 12 years now yeah i apprenticed with a guy in Fort Collins, James Bleakley, Black Sheep Bikes. Okay. And I did that, I guess, 13 or 14 years ago. And then I built a few bikes and then I guess started building bikes for other folks maybe 12 years ago, something like that. Uh, this is a Taiwanese production bike. Okay. And the age of that portion of the company is around five years. You had input into the tubing and where all the bosses are. I mean, you you even brazed with them for a little while, right? Yeah, the seat stays, the chain stays, the dropouts, axles, hangers. Um, all the down tubes, head tubes, those are all custom machine made. Your design. Made to my design. So it, the, the, the coolest part about that is being a custom builder, I'm I'm buying a Paragon head tube. I'm buying a dropout. I'm buying this thing. But now every single thing in these bikes or some of the handle bikes or whatever it is, they're all drawn to my spec. So that's been a really cool part to have, you know, all that available and all that you know expertise gone into it especially through those machine shops and just the crazy bike nerdery over there you know, so that's good to hear they're nerds too oh yeah did they provide any input that helped you as well yeah for sure i i like i have one memory of um some of the people i work with this young lady she was like telling me about 141 qr boost and i was like I don't even know what you're talking right. about. And she goes, well, I do, yeah, you know, like it's a thing. Yeah. we know this. And That's so cool. it, it's uh, yeah, definitely big bike nerds. And the guys that I worked with, they definitely rode bikes and um, yeah, they were into it and, and um, smart people. I think all the way through from the machine shops to the heat treaters to everyone involved, every little place I went into, it just seemed like there were smart people and really like industrious and on it. And, and I think, if you could generalize Taiwan, I would definitely put them as like very sharp folks that like 
don't cut corners. So that was cool to go into and like really benefit from is like their expertise. That's in, awesome. In the frames and in the bike building. So Shell's being humble and downplaying his role. He, I mean, every detail of this he's designed and he worked with them in partnership to make it even better. And a lot of times when you hear of small builders going overseas to build frames, it's more like, well, this is how I would do it if I were building it, but we're cutting all these corners to save cost. And I'm, I'm so, it's so refreshing to hear that you didn't do that. You actually came out with a potentially better product by doing that. And boy, it sure looks beautiful. Um, it's pretty cool. I haven't seen a Taiwan frame that's been braced before. And I love the bronze. It looks like what your bikes are known for. And it's cool that they could keep it braised and, and keep it bronze and keep it looking exactly like the ones you've always built. It's a, at a time. It, the brazing is a challenge because you get more heat into the bike. So you know, you're fighting a little more um, alignment, you know, and these bikes are perfectly aligned. And so like if you have a welded bike, you just have like a little bit less post. Yeah. Um, and then also the aesthetic of it too, like it, it's difficult. And sure. um, I am not by far from the best brazer that I know. And these guys are all better than me. I, I went over there and I remember getting into the factory. There were three guys and one of them was young. He was, you know, early 20s maybe mid twenties. And, um, I went over and I was like, man, is he any good at this? And I thought, oh, I don't know. And, and I remember physically like kind of hurrying across the shop and they had already brazed a few bikes uh -huh. and stuff and, and kind of to watch him a little bit. And I remember it was not like two days later and I was sitting there and I screwed some stuff up and I would hand my bike to this young kid and he would fix <laughs> some of my work. And so it definitely, that's a big part of what makes it really hard is to find those skills. And, yeah. and it's not like, TIG welders couldn't braise. Sure. They could definitely be taught, but there's just not too many people doing it. So those parts about it make it a little more difficult. Oh, the brazing is, it, it adds a little level of uh, rarity of skill and um, kind of that sort of thing in Taiwan. So it, yeah. it's a little harder to accomplish, but it, for me, it's, it's what money bikes is. Yeah. You totally know, worth it. Brazing. Yeah. Yeah. It looks beautiful. And it, it's one of the many things that set your guys stuff apart. All right, it's time to throw this thing on the geo meter and see what the geo looks like with the 160 mil 27.5 fork with 27.5 tires. <laughs> this is a small, I'm 5'6", and uh, this is the same size that Shell rides and we're the same height, so I'm excited to see what it would feel like to have the designer ride the bike in their size. That's pretty exciting. Here we go, let's measure some geo here. Front center, 710. Rear center is... Oh man, 415, chainstay, 417, reach, 382, head angle, 64.5 degrees, effective seat tube angle is 72.8 degrees. And remember, we're running this really big 160 fork, so it's a little bit slacker than if you were to run like a 120 or even a 140 29er. So bottom bracket drop unsagged right now, and we're running a, a Vigilante 2.8 and a Trail Boss 2.65, so it's even slacker than normal, a little bit taller in the front. We've got a 17 mil bottom bracket drop, and stack measures at 595. So this is a La Roca V2. Yeah. I hear the V3 is coming out soon. Can you tell us what's different between the two? Sure. Um... Not, not any huge changes. The biggest one, uh, people like longer and longer droppers. So we went to kind of the external studs uh, for the bottle boss here. So we're not uh, impeding any kind of dropper insertion. And know. some of the larger sizes um, are going a little bit more compact on the seat tube just to run a maximum dropper. Um, I went back and forth, but I wanted the small size to run a bottle. So the, the smallest size got a tiny bit shorter and will still fit a short bottle on the seat tube. And yeah, so same geo, just kind of more accommodations for those of us that like really long droppers. More accommodation there. Cool. Some other tiny little changes, sure, but nothing, sure. uh, nothing crazy. Awesome. Um, we think the V2 is probably the best hardtail on the planet, so we just changed it a little bit. <laughs> totally unbiased, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to take this out on the trail and verify that claim and see if it's the best hardtail on the market. It, if it's half as good as it looks, it will be the best hardtail on the market. It looks so good. Now, you've got two color options. There's this one, which is uh, which is my favorite finish. I, I think the, the stock phosphate, I call it the phosphate finish. It's a phosphate um, treatment to give it that, that etch to to let the clear coat adhere. Mm. But we also do one that's called Turbo Midnight. 
and that's uh, kind of an acid etch and that darkens the steel and gives it high contrast to the brass. Um, that's all done uh, with labor. Yeah. So it's it's cool looking, um, but it, it costs a little bit more. But that's uh, that's our Turbo Midnight. Sweet. So a couple options there for finish. Well, Shell, thank you so much for bringing this by so we could take a first look at it, learn a little bit more about you, about your business and your process, your super unique design aspects. Tomorrow, Shell and I are going to take this thing out on the trail and take it for a ride. It's been super fun taking a look at this thing. Thanks for watching, everybody. There's a party in the mountains, and you're invited. <laughs>